Uh, my name is Rudy Casares. I'm a professor here, um, Chicano Studies and Communication Studies. Um, and I have a couple of questions that I've uh, kind of written down. And the first one is, um, knowing that uh, working white men is the big group that came out for uh, Donald Trump, do we see a new sleeping giant in the future? Um, previously, it's been that the Latino community has been the sleeping giant. Um, and with today's population growing more and more immigrant, uh, do we have a new sleeping giant? My second question has to go towards uh, immigration. Um, how, do, uh, how do Latinos and Asians poll in immigration uh, uh, along with um, national security and, and, and uh, how do they pull in education, excuse me, uh, up there with immigration and, and uh, national security and economics? And my last question, sorry so many, but if I don't ask them now, I'd never get them in. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, it looks like the, the, the demographic... Actually, I think we need to fit in as many people as possible. So okay. We... Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. The, the, the connection with the Democratic Party seems to be a lot elitist in Los Angeles. Uh, they come, they do fundraisers uh, with very large Hollywood pockets and, and um, that type of connection. Have they lost their connection to the base? Right. Thanks. I mean, I think in terms of pundits, like most people would argue that the reason that... They, that the Democratic Party did not see this coming is, is precisely that, that they, had, they did lose their connection with, with working class voters who at one point were really their base. Um, and that's, I think, you know, as the Democratic Party does its own autopsy after this election, I think that's one of the areas that they're certainly gonna focus on. Um, we're gonna try to fit in as many questions as possible. So, so not everybody has to answer every question. So does, does one of you wanna weigh in on the first one? <laughs> on the issues side, um, for Asian Americans, when we polled um, and asked, folks about what, what issues kind of drove their vote for president. Uh, economy jobs was number one, and that's, that's often number one for Asian American voters. Uh, education was two, healthcare was three, uh, and um, immigration was four. So, you know, certainly these are all, you know, issues that are gonna play out during the next um, four years and beyond. And, and um, so, I mean, as I mentioned, you know, based on the polling that, that we and others have done, you know, it, it, it's, it's certainly likely that Asian Americans are going to uh, strongly oppose a lot of them. Well, we also heard anecdotally, and maybe you can shed some light upon this, but that the national security argument may have tilted some women who were undecided. Um, and that, I mean, it has in the past. We had what, security moms who were the former soccer moms. Um, so is that an argument that tends to work with women? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to answer, but I also want to... Sure, get, sure, sure. Well, why don't yeah. you go ahead and then I'll, I'll jump in. Are you sure? Okay. <laughs> um, I think there is, um, and I think one of the interesting things um, that we don't always talk about is that that security argument actually works with young voters too, hmm. particularly when something specific has happened. So if you think about this election cycle and the way that San Bernardino happened, the way that oh, Paris yeah. happened, that there were, you know, school shootings, there were a lot of things kind of going on that, that kind of re-triggered that anxiety around 9-11 um, that many young voters, again, would never, you know, in answering surveys or anything else, kind of say, we, uh, we did some polling um, 2008 and 2012 with young voters in particular, and we did a survey experiment, which is essentially we talked about their attitudes on immigration, and then we just flipped what the reason for you know, changing the policy would be, right? So are you, are you um, in favor of you know, securing the borders more it, because of what we would call illegal immigration in the survey question to make sure it was translatable to everyone? Um, or are you in favor of securing the borders for terrorism? And what we found among young voters, those more racially diverse, more immigrant background voters, is that when you change the prompt to terrorism, they are just as conservative as Gen X and baby boomers and older voters. Um, and so I think there is something around this, particularly for those young white women mm -hmm. who might have cast their votes for Trump w without ever telling a soul mm -hmm. if they could um, around this security issue. So in terms of uh, this idea of the sleeping giant or a new giant, um, it's always been there. Uh, so Latin the Latino population is 17% of the U.S. population, but we are merely 10% of the national electorate. Um, the white population is somewhere in the 60-something percent of the total population, but in terms of the electorate, they make up about 75% of the electorate. So um, the white electorate is a significantly large electorate that cannot be ignored. Uh, having said that, the Republican Party still faces a demographic problem. 
Uh, so I can't recall the exact figure, somewhere like 63,000 or 70 something thousand Latinos turn 18 every month. Uh, even if you have zero immigration, that number is not gonna change demographically. So the Republican Party still has a demographic challenge ahead. Um, the strategy moving forward for the, de I mean, so the Republican Party has a demographic challenge. The strategy moving forward for the Democratic Party is clear. Who do you, who do you reach out to go after white voters, rural white voters, others? Um, the challenge for the Republican Party then is to try to pick away at Latino or Asian American voters. Having poisoned the well, I just don't know how they're going to do that moving forward. I think we have a student uh, who's over here. Uh, hello, my name is Jose Trinidad Castaneda. I'm an anthropology student here at Cal State LA. And my question is, could you expand a little bit on the integrated voter engagement model? Because I'm someone who's considering running for office in the future. Um, I'm hoping that other young people here consider running for our water districts and our local um, offices as well, because we have a huge fight ahead of us. We have so much work um, to do as a generation, probably more than all the other generations combined. So I wanted to ask if you could expand on some uh, recommendations and some strategies that we can implement at the local level. All right, thank you. Um, what I would do is I would actually refer you to a couple of different reports where this has been going on. So this has actually been tested in several states. Um, it's been tested in, in some of the battleground states, as you might expect, Ohio, Florida, Virginia, um, as well as here. Um, and so the way that it's worked here and the model I'm most familiar with is the one that California Calls did in 2012. And um, what they did was important in kind of two ways. California Calls is a coalition of organizations, community engagement and civic engagement across organizations across the entire state. So some are based in Southern California, some are based Northern, Central Valley, et cetera. Um, they did two things. Um, one was they put together kind of a list of their political agendas and then said, you know, okay, what's on the ballot and what do we want to kind of get behind? Um, and that was probably one of the most difficult conversations that they had to have because one of the things they realized that's very important about the integrated voter engagement model was that they couldn't spread themselves too thin, right? So they couldn't think about, okay, we actually agree with five different ballot initiatives that are on the ballot in 2012, or of course we had 17 to choose from, you know, this year in 2016. Instead, there had to be a very brass tacks conversation about where everyone was going to pool their resources. And so death penalty was on the ballot in 2012 and again in 2016. Some other things, um, even 47, which was criminal justice reform, you know, they had to kind of say, you know, we are actually going to focus our attention on tax reform and there's this long-term strategy. So part of the integrated voter engagement model that I didn't talk about before is really seeing your role, right, whether it's your campaign, if it's you running for office, or whether it's you know, an organization that's doing this as being part of a long-term strategy, right? A long-term strategy of building power, a long-term strategy of really getting people engaged. Um, the second element that I didn't talk as much about in terms of integrated voter engagement is kind of community leader development. So there's actually a model of engaging with the community that also includes developing those folks into actual leaders. Um, so rather than just thinking of them as, you know, someone with something to give you, i.e. Their, your, their vote, um, that those are folks not only who have resources of themselves, but also need to be cultivated into leadership and potentially running for office themselves one day. So again, that kind of model, um, and it's a model that's been used successfully in the healthcare area. Um, so if you think about Latino communities and the promotora, kind of cultural model, um, that, those kinds of models in other sectors were actually the inspiration for thinking through this integrated voter engagement model. Um, and there are a couple of uh, reports that the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at USC, where I'm an affiliated faculty, has um, actually produced. Uh, and so if you go to their website, you'd be able to download the reports and hear about what happened in Florida, what happened in Ohio, what happened in Virginia, and how it could work here. Good luck. Uh, the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at USC. Anybody else have uh, any questions? Okay, let's go over here. I have a long question, but still one, just one question. Um, after the day after the election, NPR brought in a poster, and this poster not only asked people who they're voting for, but their enthusiasm for that candidate, and people were overwhelmingly enthusiastic about Donald Trump, the people that were already gonna vote for him. As for Hillary Clinton, her voters or her supporters were not that enthusiastic, um, and the difference was like, really big. Um, 
did the Democrats, you know, what does it say first? And did the Democrats put up the right candidate? And if we look back a oh, one year from today, it seems that there was not really real competition towards her. You know, um, I remember looking at the first debate, um, it was Hillary Clinton and everyone else. There was not really like an attempt by the Democratic Party to, you know, make a real challenge against her. Um, and so was this maybe like that led to her loss or a loss for the Democrats? <laughs> you, I mean, well, that, so I Bernie know. Sanders, I mean, he, he yeah, did give her quite it, the know. run. So, um, <laughs> right. I mean, he, well, I think he surprised people. And I mean, certainly when she entered the race, she was a dominant frontrunner because of her name. She's been around for, you know, longer than most of us have been alive in the public eye. Um, she had enormous amounts of money, you know, huge fundra fundraising capacity. So p other people looked at her, like Joe Biden looked at her, you know, you know and all of the th things that she had going for her and just, you know, they decided not to run. Um, Bernie Sanders was a surprise. And I think some people wonder, you know, if, if Trump had been running against a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren type, would the result have been the same? Because those are two people who also sort of tapped tap that populist message and that, you know, the, the idea that there's this group of people, even if the economy's better, unemployment's down, mm -hmm. but there's this group of people who feel left behind. And I think some people would argue that Hillary Clinton never fully tapped that message. And, you know, throughout, if you look at the end of her campaign, it was so much, it really, a lot of, so much of it focused on why Donald Trump was not fit for office, not, what, you know, here's what I'm going to do for you. I mean, she had she had tons of plans, she had tons of policies, but her, you know, the advertisements and like really the core message was about him being basically temperamentally unfit to lead the nation. Um, so I think that these are all really good questions that Democrats are going to be asking themselves, you know, as they consider what exactly just happened. And the other thing I think we shouldn't forget is that it's really hard for a party to hold on to the White House for three terms in a row. You know, it's happened so few times in the past. I'm sorry, I, I think the last one was uh, George H.W. Bush in 92, but before that it hadn't happened in forever. Um, so I mean, as a country, we also do like to go back and forth. Um, and I think that's something that we shouldn't, you know, that's not necessarily Hillary Clinton's fault, but more just, you know, our, our traditions. Um, yeah, and I agree with that. And, but in addition to that, there's also the, the um, sort of the woman card, as she said. <laughs> Um, there, we can't discount the fact that uh, she was the first really, you know, strong, viable female candidate, and that um, in our poll, what we saw, and we're still once again unpacking all of this, but um, I did see that there was a turning point at uh, around 9/11. There was the deplorables comment, and then there was her health, and we saw a change in men's voting at that time. That uh, it was kind of like a little switch was turned, and men went over to the other side, and uh, sort of never really came back. So there were, I mean, there were some dives. The video uh, came out and it kind of sort of narrowed again and some men came back in, but then um, it went up again. So, and that's across the board men. Uh, haven't really, once again, pulled out this in any detail because I just haven't had time. But I do think that we can't discount the fact that it's still hard for a lot of people to vote for a woman. And I think that um, there is uh, potential for for saying that you know, when, when she exhibited some weakness um, in that illness. And they were, you know, of course, the other side was pounding her for being ill and uh, not being able to, to accomplish this. And so, you know, taking that uh, makes a lot of people nervous. So I think that, that we can't discount that as really bad timing, number one. She had, um, you know, Barack Obama the first time, a uh, rock star, and then, um, you know, Donald Trump, who is an unprecedented candidate. I mean, how in the world can someone say all of the things that he said and get elected? Um, and, you know, she, she didn't really have the ability to ever get her feet under her, and, as you were saying, and, and have something else go on because there was just this constant news cycle of mm -hmm. the latest crazy thing that But I think some of these things were also decisions their campaign made. Their campaigns were to made a strategic decision or what yeah. they thought was a strategic decision to let him hang himself with his own words. Yeah. That clearly didn't work out, but they thought that out. at the time that they were, you know, by letting the news cycle focus on him, that they, that, that was helping them out. And then also, I mean, some of these things like the health issue, these are, or the emails. I mean, these are, you know, problems that her campaign had where, you know, the health issue, if she had disclosed it, that wouldn't have been a great news day for her, but, you know, before. Um, but it, then there would not be video of her collapsing on the street. Like, that was not good for her. And that was, you know, like, the, her campaign made a decision not to, and she, or she made a decision not to disclose that she had pneumonia. Um, so, and, you know, that, I mean, that, one of the knocks against the Clintons is that they have a penchant for secrecy. And when you do stuff like that, then that sort of reinforces that. So, I mean, I don't want to argue that this is all, you know, one side's victory or one side's 
fault, but you know, her campaign did make some mistakes as well. Mm -hmm. I think we have somebody. I can't see in the light. I'm sorry. Oh, somebody over here. Hello, my name is Colleen Friend. I'm a professor here at Cal State LA, and my question is for Jill. Jill, you talked about your relationship with your participants, so I wondered if you could say more about how you maintained it and if you offered any incentives. Thank you. Sure, yeah. The, um, the panel as a whole, um, not just the election panel, but for the Understanding America study panel, uh, when we recruit them, we send them a, a piece of mail that has a $5 bill in it. Um, and if they send back their uh, initial survey and consent to uh, go forward with us, we pay, uh, I think it's $2 for five minutes, um, for five minutes of survey work that they do. So uh, any surveys that they do, uh, they accumulate these sort of small amounts. And they do probably, I don't know, maybe between two and four per month. So it's not a large amount of money that we're paying, but. Uh, there are some other surveys that we do, like we have a lot of uh, sort of interesting things going on where people are wearing devices and recording their activities and also telling us about themselves and that sort of thing where there's some, a, a little bit more money. We also maintain a relationship with them by, uh, we have a newsletter. Um, we occasionally ask some questions that are uh, sort of on the level of uh, would be interesting for people to see what the responses are and, and we give them that. We send them uh, Christmas gifts once a year. Um, so we do, we have a 24-hour uh, help desk, basically. Um, we're in contact with people, making sure that they're able to get in, that if they haven't been engaged, that we're finding out why. Um, so we do make a lot of effort to help people stay engaged. Uh, we have some people who did some very interesting um, work using some of the data that we have that found that, uh, you know, that there's certain sort of personality types who are more likely to stay engaged in a panel. So we're looking at some underlying um, things about what we might not be able to detect with just demographics, uh, you know, like people who are, are tend to be sort of more outgoing and more engaged or likely to stay more engaged. So, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing we're, we're also looking at so that we might be able to start thinking about how to apply some of those things in terms of uh, adjustments that might be needed. We also, of course, refresh and um, keep our panel going all the time. but. But we have a, a pretty good uh, retention rate. We have somebody over here. Charlie, Charlie Wu, member of the Pat Brown Institute Advisory Board. A couple questions, uh, brief questions. One is on the difference in uh, polling for the Latino and Asian community. And the way I understand the argument for defending both sides is that for those that have done pre-election tracking, is that uh, that those exit, uh, election day exit poll, uh, the precincts they picked didn't really represent the community. For those that defend that exit polling, their argument is you guys have done pre-tracking polling, only focus on high propensity voters, so that there's a hidden voters there that you guys never tap in to show up on the day of the election. And I just want you to comment on, are there any shy voters that, that are not participating in your poll but actually show up that impact the election? The second quick question is for Jill. You mentioned uh, incidences in the campaign that changed the vote, but you didn't mention the FBI letter to the Congress about the investigation. How big was that? Well, maybe I'll start with that one. <laughs> uh, we're, we're looking at that very carefully, as you can imagine. It's um, something that we you know, want to make sure that we have really examined. We have a variety of different models we're taking a look at. That's been the focus of, uh, of a lot of in the analysis that every minute I have in the last few days, I've been really trying to see if there's um, what we can see in that. And I think that our, our analysis is still ongoing, and so I don't really want to characterize it because um, it isn't obvious. It's a small period of time after you know that. It was just the final uh, few days of the election. So it makes it a little more difficult. But you know, in, in some models, yes, we see a definite correlation and others we don't, so we're still, we're still really unpacking that. Uh, and then the other one I'll let you. Yeah, just uh, with any poll that you do, the question is, is it random, is it representative of the social demographic characteristics of the broader population you're, you're serving? If it's not, then it's skewed. It doesn't matter how, what the sample size is, as long as it's representative. So if the, the census characteristics of Latinos are reflected in the poll, then you're on to something. 
you also want to, and I don't want to get into too much methods here, but you also want to supplement some of the polling with some of the other work that we're doing, which is ecological inferencing. That is, you want to look at actual voter files, actual turnout in particular geographic districts and see what are those characteristics. Are they turning out at, at higher rates from the previous election? What about their vote choice? So all of that uh, together then gives us a better profile of, of, the, uh, of the voter. So yeah, I mean, I think weighting schemes can kind of help address some of those problems. You know, th there is the question, right? Who's answering, uh, who's responding and who's not, right? And I think you, your data kind of points to, to some of those answers, but um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant tension that I think uh, folks who do polling deal with. Um, and you know, there are, there are new techniques to kind of help address some of those problems, so yeah. I think that there are. I think that there are some people that it's hard to reach by phone. Um, and, you know, our, our numbers don't look like yours in terms of the um, Hispanic vote in our pre-election. Uh, and then in the post-election, it's a, it's a little bit different. We have 25% uh, um, among Hispanics voting for Trump and really saw big differences in our small sample between different subgroups. but. Um, you know, I, I'm really interested in talking to you after this about, um, you know, ways that we can think about how to, how to uh, model our data uh, going in that, that are going to give us a better look at it. But I think that there are, are, there are hidden voters in every category. Um, and I think that we uh, talk to people who, and, and allow people to participate who may not have any other way to have, sort of have a voice. So I think that it's definitely worth looking into. And more directly to your question about the hidden voters uh, from, from Mr. Wu. And now the idea is, now, when I teach survey research methods, I often say we often differentiate between a poll and a survey. And in polling work, typically campaigns, candidates, you know, people that are trying to win elections, they basically sample registered voters. So yeah, so people that are new to the electorate, those that are newly registered or don't have a vote history, those tend to be undersampled. Now in academic surveys, then we, wanted, we generally want to do these broader uh, samples of, of the electorate, or sorry, broader samples of the population to determine those that are even non-citizens. But again, for a candidate campaign election, nobody cares about, you know, they don't care about non-citizens, so they're not studied. But those are some of those tensions that, that emerge when you, when, you, when you decide to undertake a, a, a study of a population. Um, so we have, uh, we're basically running out of time, but we have a couple more questions we want to try to get in. So if everyone could keep their questions super short and not everybody needs to answer. If we keep our answers super short, that would be great too. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. And um, my name is Byron Reed and I'm representing Wells Fargo and I'm a former PBI board member. Uh, my question is specific to, I keep hearing a lot about um, working class white men that are not college educated. Has any time or an effort been spent around Asian, African American, and other working class men that don't have college educations? Has any conversations been around that? Because I keep hearing as if this white working class has this, this bearing on all of us. And I've not heard anything said about African American or Asian working class, uneducated, or uncollege educated men. I mean, I think the, if we look at past election results, if you look at African American vote, if you look at Latino vote, if you look at the Asian American vote, it tends to vote, I mean, these groups tend to vote so democratically that I don't know that there have been you know, particular efforts aimed at, at subgroups. Yeah. I don't know what the efforts are. I know the past mm -hmm. is the past, but what has been done in this election year, specifically those populations? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you in ours um, that there is no, among African Americans in our sample, there isn't any other variable that's significant. Education, location, none of it. I don't have enough of that sample to give. Thanks. I think there's somebody back there. Hi, my name is Rebecca Joseph, and I'm a professor here. I'm a Jewish woman, and I think one of the things that you haven't addressed is the effect of Steve Bannon on Trump and the messaging that he put out. And I just read a book called The Hillbilly Elegy that goes and looks at white um, America and the messages they're getting are not the messages we're getting in California. There are two messages going out. They're getting Fox, racist, white messaging going to them. And I want to know how is that affecting the polling that you're doing when you're not sampling people that um, 
are really going to say what they think about me um, in the poll. Okay. Well, I think that I think that our method actually does help um, sort of get at that in the sense that I think that if there is a way to get the shy voter to speak up and actually say what's going on, that that you know perhaps the methods that we're using are the best way to do that. Um, absolutely, what I talked about earlier about the bubble. I mean, just the fact that if you if you never step out of that and go look to see what other people are are consuming. Um, you know, it can be, I think that's why everybody sort of woke up and said, wait, what happened? Because if you actually were watching those other news outlets and, and you had an idea about what was going on with Breitbart, and honestly, I'd never heard of it before they started saying that we were the best poll ever. And, and then I started, I started reading what, you know, what was on there and, and, and realizing how much of, of this uh, sort of information is all funneled in one way by some organizations, but you can say that about both sides. You also have, you know, uh, a lot of information being funneled a certain way and, and things being emphasized and not. Um, but I think that there's just a lot of outright lying out there. Um, the, I think that something that we didn't do this year that I would definitely want to do next time is to ask people where they got their information. Um, that would be a very useful thing, and it's something that we can start doing as we're doing follow-ups. We're going to continue collecting data. We have a panel. We can keep doing that, which is fantastic. So we're going to be looking at that. Also, I mean, I think the Steve Bannon question is a great question, but we could probably devote a whole panel to Steve Bannon and <laughs> what you know what role he's going to have in terms of the Trump White House. Um, but maybe we could you know we can also I'll take questions after this is done because uh, I think we're trying to squeeze in a couple more. So I can't. There we go. Right over there. Uh, my name is sorry, Marna Cornell, and I'm with the League of Women Voters. Uh, have you seen statistics on when you take the 2012 election and break it down by groups? What groups changed and by gender? I just was at um, an event where a, a professor did that and broke, broke them up, and it was very interesting. Uh, across the line in many categories, men switched from Democratic votes uh, to Republicans, some percentage of that. And I thought comparing those two elections could give us some really pertinent information for the future. Absolutely. Um, we have done some preliminary work with that from our pre-election data, but I'm really waiting for the post-election data where we have um, actual vote. Uh, and comparing what people told us before and after. We also know how they voted in 2012, and that's definitely one of the things we're going to be looking at. Yeah, but, so the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the data is there, but even, even among Latinos, there, there was throughout the polling that we did prior to the election and across other uh, states, you did see a gender gap as well. So, for example, in the election eve poll, uh, Latinos, 71% uh, voted for Clinton. Among women, Latinas, it was 86 percent uh, voting for Clinton. So uh, that's a significant gap there as well among among Latinos. So you know we often look at segments of the electorate. You know, African American voters this way, Latinos, a Asian Americans. But within those populations, <laughs> there's significant variations uh, across different demographic uh, groupings. Mm -hmm. and I think unfortunately, oh, I think we have. Yeah, I think. Uh, we have one more question and Good then we have to wrap I'm it up. Good morning. I'm Martha Sklar. I'm also a member of the League of Women Voters. And I think we had a perfect storm here. We had the issue of the fact that we usually don't have three terms with the same party. Right. Uh, we had all other kinds of problems with the um, Republican Party having 11 or more candidates for the primary. I'm really more concerned about the attitude of women and one of the panelists talked about young girls pick a male to be their um, leader. Uh, I'm really more concerned is how many women voted against Hillary Clinton because she's a woman and how many men voted against her because she's a woman. And what do we do about um, instilling in Teen, younger people, even younger than teenagers, that women can be leaders and executives just as well as men. Um, 
So, so just as you were saying about Steve Bannon, I think we could do an entire panel. Um, and in fact, we have done panels, um, particularly around women's leadership in Los Angeles um, and the way in which there are some challenges there. Um, I think I'll say two quick things because I know we want to wrap up. Um, first and foremost, um, as I said before, there really was a race gender gap here. Um, for Latinas, for African American women, um, and uh, and one of the things that I think is driving uh, the Latina represent uh, Latina voting that um, Adrian was just talking about is um, there is one of the fastest growing sectors of entrepreneurs in the country are Latina owned businesses. Um, it's actually the fastest growing sector of people who are starting their own businesses in this country. And so I think there are both a number of civic organizations as well as kind of this very much big push towards entrepreneurship that is changing that perception of whether or not women believe that women can actually be leaders, right? Um, I think that's also true in the African American community in terms of African American women. Um, they are actually the second fastest growing um, area of entrepreneurship. So I think among among those two demographic groups, those two race gender pairs, um, there is, you know, this very much this sense that women can be leaders. And also, I think one of the things that was very significant for Hillary Clinton that we haven't talked about a lot is that if you think about who Hillary Clinton would have brought into office with her in terms of who she surrounded herself with, in terms of her closest aides to that Steve Bannon comment that was just mentioned, the contrast is stark, right? Whether it's Huma Abedin, whether it's Cheryl Mills, whether it's you know other women that she was working with, she would have brought in a more racially diverse set of women than I would contend even Barack Obama did in 2008. Well, there was talk that she would uh, make half for cabinet members women. So yeah, yeah it would have been a completely- But not just half women, right. half including right. women of color. Right. So it would have been, again, that race right. gender pair that I think was really important. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing I would say in terms of how we actually change that, the way in which you focus on implicit bias and undoing implicit bias is, of course, first to identify and actually know, right? So there's a test you can take. It's free. It's online. 14 million people have taken it. It's translatable in 25 different languages so even if English is not your first language you can take it and find out you know because again even women have these biases right and so I think to the degree that you start doing that kind of conversation with young girls and not just telling them they can be anything not just telling them that they're smart right because I think one of the challenges when people are told that they're smart at least the research has shown is that when they actually encounter a challenge they're actually more likely to give up. They're more likely to say, you know, oh, well, maybe I'm just not smart enough to figure it out. I think one of the things the Clinton campaign has really demonstrated here is that no matter how many times you get knocked down, you get back up, right? And I think she just said that to the Children's Defense Fund last night um, in her first public appearance. And so I think communicating the message, and this is the, me the message that com gets communicated to girls is that you're smart. The message that gets communicated to boys is, even if you're not smart, you can work on it, you can fix it, you can learn, you can change your behavior, you can do things. And so it's not to say that girls aren't smart and not tell them that they aren't capable, but to say you can actually develop a resilient kind of attitude. Because one of the th challenges we've actually found in Los Angeles specifically is that many women don't want to run for office because they see exactly what has been done to Hillary Clinton and other women leaders for the past 30 years. They say, I don't want to put my family through that. I don't want to put myself through that, right? We know that Latinas wait until they are two or three times more qualified than the average male to actually run for office. This is work by Christina Bejarano, who has surveyed at fully qualified women who are actually thinking about it and thinking about running for office, but they don't think they're qualified enough until actually objectively they're two or three more times qualified. Um, I think the Clinton campaign and what's gone on in this election will be a sobering thing that actually has to be counteracted right, um, that a fully qualified woman, regardless of whether you agreed with her politics, right, um, could lose so horribly in this kind of context. And with that, I'm sorry, we have to cut it off, but thank you so much for all the great working panelists and all the great questions.